Hello and welcome everyone. In this mini lecture we're going to take a look at Judith Sargent Murray and her work on the equality of the sexes. And this is actually one of my favorite pieces given what time it was written and the ways in which Murray actually really kind of sets the record straight about the nature of equality in the sexes. So Judith Sargent Murray was a writer. Uh, she was born in 1751, lived to 1820. Uh, in the work that we look at on the equality of the sexes, it trumped, uh, or I should say, you know, it came out, it preempted Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Man. Uh, Vindication of the Rights of Man came out in 1793, 1794. It was a year or two after Murray writes this essay. Vindication of the Rights of Man is a very massive book, um, and it very much is a similar message that Murray is talking about. And Wollstonecraft is writing in England, um, not in the Americas. I think it's also interesting to note that Mary Wollstonecraft uh, also has a daughter uh, who we all know as Mary Shelley. And Mary Shelley goes on to write the, the famous book Frankenstein. And Frankenstein is a fascinating book which is about a man, Dr. Frankenstein, trying to create life without a woman. That is, he tries to create life from collecting dead body pieces together and using chemistry essentially to create life, so thereby bypassing woman, woman altogether and her necessary role in procreation. So Murray, her essay preempts Wollstonecraft um, and I think it's, you know, I think in some profound ways we could call Murray a feminist, even though that term, as we understand it, wasn't around in the 1700s. It, there was no real language for that. Nobody necessarily perceived this idea of equal rights among the sexes. And that's something worth noting, is the term feminist in its most barest bones is this idea of equal value, equal recognition, equality between the sexes. In our modern culture, the, the uh, I would say there's been a very strong move, and in some ways, unfortunately, a successful move uh, within the right to create feminism as something negative, as something bad, as, as this idea of fierce, um, I don't know, fierce anti-men or man-hating movement. And really what it is is saying, okay, we need a more fairer society. We need things to work not just for men, which that has been the tradition for thousands of years, but there needs to be fair equality in which women have equal access, equal opportunity. And we have to still say today that given... For every one dollar a male makes, a woman makes 75 to 80 cents on that dollar. We're still not necessarily there. A lot of Murray's beliefs and ideas came from her, or were inspired by her religious views, which were universalist. And a universalist um, is a type of Christian, but not one that is that is tied up in a lot of the heavy dogma that you see with Catholicism or even some of the other types of uh, Protestantism that comes through. The idea is more focused on the positive messages that are present within Christianity and less on the uh, those in which people are punished or deemed less valuable or things like that. And one of the things she does within this essay, which is written in the you know, 1790s, so it is a product of the Enlightenment, is that she uses the language of the Enlightenment to destroy or to disregard or to say why man's dominance in culture is unacceptable or should not work. That is, if we believe in the ideas of the Enlightenment, then we have to recognize that men should not be dominant, that there should be equality among the sexes. And at large, within this piece, I think, you know, what she does really well and has been done or continues to be done up through today is she isn't just talking about individuals. You know, she isn't just talking about this person is sexist and that person is sexist. She's talking about the ways in which the institutions, in which the culture promotes these inequalities, in which the culture shows or creates realities for the different sexes in which equality isn't possible. And f 
she also, um, within her life and within this, also talks about religious inequalities, right? The religious inequalities in which, you know, women in the Christian tradition are extremely secondary. They cannot hold um, in many of the, you know, in many of the different uh, denominations of Christianity, can't hold a place, a, a place of power within the churches, uh, are seen as problematic, are seen as descendants of Eve, and therefore continual temptations to man. And man is really the important, is the central figure of Christianity. All right, so on the quality of sexes, it was published in 1790, and it was published in the Massachusetts Magazine. And I like this this question she asks very early on. Are we deficient in reason? Are we deficient in reason? We can only reason from what we know, and if an opportunity of acquiring knowledge hath been denied us, the inferiority of our sex cannot be fairly deduced from thence. So what she's talking about here is education. right? She's saying, are we deficient in reason? We can only reason from what we know. right? We can only reason given on the knowledge we've been given. And if an opportunity of acquiring knowledge hath been denied us, if you haven't given us an education, then the inferior, inferiority of our sex cannot be fairly deduced from this. You can't call us deficient in reason if you've never given us an education. Right? That's one of the, you know, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about institutional issues that she's addressing. She's saying, you know, systematically, you're denying women education, and then you're saying, oh, you women are deficient in reason. Well, you can't say we're deficient in reason if you haven't given us the tools to actually learn and make sense of reason. Will it be said that the judgment of a male of two years old is more sage than that of a female of the same age? I believe the reverse is generally observed to be true. But from that period, what partiality? How is the exalted one in the other depressed by the contrary modes of education which are adopted? The one is taught to aspire, and the other is, co is early confined and limited. As their years increase, the sister must be wholly domesticated, while the brother is led by the hand through all the flowery paths of science. Grant that their minds are by natural equal, yet who shall wonder at the apparent superiority, if indeed custom becomes second nature? Nay, if taketh the place of nature, and that it doth the experience of each day will events." So again here, she's saying, you've got two two-year-olds, male and female. You cannot really say which one is, whose judgment is better. You know, who is smarter, who is more intelligent. But what happens from there is that men or boys are continually pushed in that direction of science and learning and knowledge, while girls and women are continually pushed to stay in the home. They're confined and limited. They are taught, you know, to be domesticated, not to actually learn about science and knowledge and philosophy, but sent down this other path. And so what we think of as a natural or what they thought of as natural. Oh, well, it's perfectly natural that girls want to be domestic and boys want to go out and do science is not natural. It's a consequence of the system. And this is something we see even through today, that when we look at children in the toys that are marketed towards girls and the toys that are marketed towards boys, right? With girls, you still have princesses. Look at the Disney princesses. You can say, well, you know, you have ones that are more physically athletic and blah, 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 but they're all princesses. They're all, they're all within this view of to be treated and to have, you know, dainty things. Whereas men, you know, they're they're all the, the, you know, they have the transformers and these and that, and you know, they, they're meant to be more rebunctious. We don't see, we don't even see within men this attempt to tame down heroes, right? We see it with women. They they attempt to try to give you more a wider range of 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 female icons, some of which are more aggressive or more powerful, right? You have Mulan, you have Brave, um, but we don't see the equal the equal the equal side on the on the male's behalf in which you have toys that are more that are less aggressive so as you finish or as you read through Murray's on the equality of the sexes be aware of the ways in which she identifies those structural differences the ways in which she says this is how the system leads us down these different paths and what are some of her criticisms does she offer any solutions what do we think of that material all right that's the end of this mini lecture. Thank you for listening. See you in the next one.